Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We have the pop-up cube. We'll do whatever it takes to get the stories. We're here, and Sanjeev Mohan with Sanjo's here. Uh, CUBE alumni, CUBE collective contributor, and also um, very distinguished and industry analyst that uh, recognizes the best industry analyst, former Gartner, got your own practice. Sanjeev, you're a great friend of theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, all we talk about when we're on theCUBE between you, me, and Dave is data, because that's yep. your forte. Um, but this data's now gotten so big from an aperture standpoint. There's data applications, there's data engineering, there's data analytics, there's data science, there's data, all, all kinds of new gyrations of data. AI right now, it's very clear that the role of data is of the, the number one discussion. How do you think about it? What's the platform architecture look like? Is it a reset, is it a redo? Is, it a, is, the, is the script flipping? So it's going to be a constant discussion because as we heard from the industry of the past year, there's a platform shift. Mm -hmm. Tokens, data's got to be available all the time. You got to move data around a lot, which shouldn't be that expensive, or it could be. There's a lot of open questions. What's your take right now as we look at the, the future now, you're starting to see the clear line forming. Old way, new way. So I, I strongly feel that we are going to rewrite the story of data in the next two years. Completely and utterly, uh, it's going to transform. So moving the data, although technology-wise it's not a big deal, you know, I think we, we have like very fast networks and storage, but the other factors that that stop us from moving data around, like security, compliance. So, what I what I'm seeing is that modern data stack has pretty much collapsed, yeah. and and I see there's the pendulum is once again shifting toward unification and a little bit of hybrid model with centralizing the infrastructure. Uh, so unifying the storage for structured, unstructured, for batch, for streaming, and then uh, putting a common layer of metadata and a semantic layer so that we can disaggregate compute. So we're going to multi-engine compute for sure. So it could be Starburst, Trino, it could be Dremio, it could be Pandas, Spark, Ray, and then LLMs. So, so the entire compute is disaggregated based on what you need. How you get to compute is also under massive change because it used to be SQL and Python rule the game. But now with natural language, even that is changing. So a lot of changes are coming. So I see, here you're right, obviously, we know the history of hyperconvergence, separating Correct. storage and compute. Right. That was a generational shift of value and new architecture. You're saying compute and data will be decoupled. Yeah, so you know when we when we disaggregated compute and store, what we actually forgot was although we disaggregated it, they were still bundled together. Yeah. You couldn't buy compute from one and store from another, but that unbundling is happening now. Yeah. And some of it is thanks to standards like Iceberg. Yeah, and by the way, Databricks uh, events coming up, so Snowflake really yeah. recently. Correct. And I won't, we'll talk a little bit about that going in, but we're here at IBM's yeah. event, which they have, a da they have database chops too, DB2 and a bunch of other right. things. Correct. And a lot of open source experience. So yeah. IBM, no, no stranger to database and data. We'll come back to that. But if you look at the, the success of say data lakes yeah. and lake houses, that kind of validates your thesis because that beat federated data modeling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an indicator that that was a good step. So the question is, what's next after, after the data lake? Are you going to have this series of streams coming off the lake? Are you going to create pipelines of new so, waterways, or what's the, so you the, know, how is that going to, because I, I can see the data lake, but I don't see that as the final answer. So I, I yeah, things will change, for sure. But for now, when you say streams, so you you mean Rivers. the water metaphor, yes, the, right? A lake is water, yeah. and it's sitting there, yeah. is it moving? So I got to move water out, get a little aqueduct yeah. out, move it out somewhere, or do I create another data lake and replicate the lake? So, so I use I, synthetic I, I, data. Right, so syn synthetic data will happen, uh, but that's for a different reason. That's, that's orthogonal to our conversation. Yeah. Uh, Conversation, but when you said streams, my mind immediately went to the real-time streaming, time streaming yes. data because even that is now being written into the lake house format. 
So Confluent, for example, announced something called TableFlow. Every single vendor is now starting to support writing their JSON, Parquet, Avro, CSV, everything with a common table format. So there's a lake house wars going on right now. Delta from Databricks, Iceberg, that pretty much everybody else supports. This week, there are actually four conferences, major conferences going on. We are at IBM Think, there's Microsoft Build, there is a Dell Technology Tech world. world, and then there's IB, uh, Informatica World. So at Microsoft Fabric, this week, Microsoft Fabric is a very big Delta user, and they're going to announce support for two things, Iceberg and Fabric writing, uh, uh, reading data directly from, from Kafka, Kinesis, and uh, Google PubSub. Does that commoditize, or is that unify? I think it commoditizes compute completely. It doesn't matter what compute you bring. If my data is in a common format, that any compute engine can yeah. uh, can access, then that compute becomes co a commodity. Okay, so what what what? Who wins and who loses in that scenario? So the way things are going, I think there are only one set of winners, and they are the hyperscalers. <laughs> I mean, if you look at even even the model, uh, like hardware will get commoditized. I think all the power is sort of concentrating into the hyperscalers. <laughs> the rich get richer. Here we go. How does IBM fit into that? Because they're not a hyperscaler, they missed that wave. They yeah. tried with SoftLayer and Bluemix. Yeah. They scuttled that ship. Now they're in a whole nother ball game. They're unifying through distributed computing. Red Hat was a great buy by Arvin. Love that move. I mean, that was like the, the, his killer move when he became CEO, because he's got that South Intel vibe going on right now where he's reinventing IBM as a product company, not so much a services company. So I got to ask you, where do you see IBM playing it? Because they're not a hyperscaler. They're almost like a glue layer between all the hyperscalers. They're doing a deal with AWS. They're selling their software, Watson X, in the marketplace. They got a deal with Azure. So, so see, they, why, why do they need to build a cloud? They just become a, a partner for the cloud providers. Right, so you know, when I said all the power is concentrating in hyperscalers, but then uh, there's a cost to that, and the cost is that now you're locked into their own stack or their own ecosystem. IBM actually has a huge advantage because IBM can be that cross cloud, like what you call super cloud, yeah. and hybrid because of Red Hat OpenShift and all these other like HashiCorp, yeah. Terraform now, and Ansible. So I think IBM has a very key role to play as a glue between all these different islands. IBM could be the super cloud layer yep. that Completely. connects all the clouds yeah. together right. by bringing all their IP to the table right. and be that layer. Arvind said it today on the partner keynote, and I've never heard IBM speak like this before. The pie is big enough for everybody. Yeah. IBM was not a pie sharer in their old days. Right. And also, John? But that means they want to work together. Yes. Yeah, also what's exciting is that all these hyperscalers we talked about, none of them have a very good consulting arm, and IBM does. So IBM can not only be that technology glue, but also have the services arm. It's interesting, because you know Azure, you know AWS, you know Google, they all have a great relationship with the Accentures, the PWCs, the Deloitte's, yeah. the persistent systems of the world, massive integrators, WePro. Yeah. What's IBM's relationship to that? Do you think that's going to be threatening to some of those relationships or additive? I, I, I don't know, I, I, I hopefully it'll be additive. I, if I just came here today, although today, is, like you said, is a partner day. Our event starts tomorrow, and I'm already blown away because there are a few thousand partners here. This place is, is packed, and in fact, I was surprised to see so many people. I asked somebody, they said, oh, our number of partners we have are in tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you, I, the new IBM, they're back. You can see that I've been saying it all on our intro package here. Um, the test for the, uh, Arvin and the team will be, can they get a partner ecosystem going? Because their old partner network had tend to be true blue partners, blue washing. They buy yeah. a company, they, they call blue washing, they become IBM blue, that's their color. So very uh, IBM centric partners. Right. Yeah. To be a true industry partner, like Amazon has a great ecosystem, so does Google now developing. You got to be independent. You got to offer them that value. Yeah. So the question is, can these partners, can IBM sell more through the partners, and can the partners sell more through the 
through right. IBM. Correct. So IBM looks to me, if at least from what I'm seeing here at the event and briefing with other customers on the side, is they're lining up properly. They're saying, hey, look at, we'll give you distribution with our sales force, go to market, so sell through us, you can sell through you, and yeah, you can have some services. Yeah. The pie, the sharing the pie. Correct, yeah. Arvin is saying yeah. directly, we want to do business with you. Right. Now the we, question is, yeah. will they follow through? We'll see. Yeah. But I don't see any reason that they're not. When I talk to the product uh, heads in IBM, I am surprised they're asking me who should we partner with. And when I tell them, when I tell small companies they should partner with IBM, they're like shocked. They're like, wait, IBM and us? We yeah. are too small. I'm like, no, no, IBM is asking yeah. to partner with small companies. So the equation has shifted. If they could replicate what Amazon did and create a true enablement model with right. partners Correct. where there's a good distribution and good monetization, yeah. they could actually, they could pull it off. They got the big brand, they got, but they haven't done it before. So we'll see, I'm very skeptical on that. I'm, I'm not down on it, show yeah. me. That's where right. I'm at. Correct. Well, let's yeah. get into the data side, data, yeah. back to the database, because we got Snowflake and Databricks coming up. Correct. The Cube will be, it looks like, definitely Snowflake, four days. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting to hear from Databricks, because we're going to get a spot at Databricks as well, um, uh, their events. So we'll have the Cube at both, both events this year, like, like we did last year. IBM's no stranger to data. How do you see their data play here? Because you know, they have a rich history, DB2, and a variety of lots of data products. Data analytics, I mean, I've interviewed Rod Thomas for the past decade, many times. Um, in fact, he quoted the famous line that I still use today, you can't have AI without IA, information architecture. Right. I don't know why they don't bring that back, because that's a great slogan. Um, so they, they, have, they have history. Uh, yes. History spark. Yeah. They have, what's your assessment? Have they been so, playing off defense, not enough offense? What's, what's, the, what's your so, analysis so of IBM's so data? So they, they have history but sometimes that history is not that rosy. I remember the days when you talk to one team at IBM, they say, oh, we only do FileNet. One team said, we only do cast iron. One team that only did WebSphere. I'm glad that some of these things, uh, islands have gone away. Uh, I, the conversations I'm now having with IBM, surprisingly, are now on how do we bring DB2 and Informix into the mix. How do we uh, how do we showcase Cognos TM1? So so these are very mature products that are no longer kind of sexy anymore. Yeah. But IBM is like if Microsoft could bring back the Mojo, IBM definitely can. I mean, if you look at what Dario presented today, Dario Gill's on stage. You probably may, may or not seen the keynote, but he's doing a demo with Cobol, training an agent. What's going on right now, we're living in an abstraction layer revolution as well. Systems revolution, I've been saying on theCUBE. But you can look at Cognos and Informex and DB2 and look at all that pre-existing brownfield or existing legacy. You could put, a, you could put an abstraction layer around that. Yeah. You could build an agent technology and right. low code or no code, automatic coding, right. to connect this and integrate it. So we're seeing the iPaaS market, integrated platform as a service, connect with Mm -hmm. the new gen AI, so, so I see an opportunity big time. Actually, you don't even need to put abstra uh, abstraction layer anymore because now with LLMs, the game has again transformed. For example, I know a bunch of banks over my years of consulting that have been on this mainframe modernization program and it has stalled. How do you modernize a joint like mainframe, but now with an LLM that's trained on yeah thousands and thousands of COBOL programs, I can actually use an LLM to do 80% of my COBOL migration to Java yeah. and modernize my entire mainframe ecosystem. I think that I think your point about that is so big, and I, this is why I'm bullish on IBM. I was just talking with another analyst on earlier today that the, as these agents become more sophisticated, not yeah. chatbots, we're talking about real agents. Correct. Real AI agents that are working on behalf of something, a user, a program, a machine, can do a lot of work mm -hmm. on well-bounded, well-formed environments. So things like mainframe migration, um, integration, API management, yeah. observability, testing, testing yeah. Yeah. deployment. Just yeah. working down yeah. the manual yeah. automation tasks right. and with Ansible, right. IBM and Red Hat and now HashiCorp, I mean, I think HashiCorp is going to be much more impacted by agents than say um, Ansible and Red Hat because you know, there's not a lot of Gen AI in there but other than doing some small things, but 
you know, with Terraform and DevOps, yeah. that can be completely run by agents. That's a future. I think next year, it'll take a couple of years, a year maybe, or two years, but I think having agents that can understand the context and the environment, and then reason, and then do orchestration and use uh, HashiCorp to, uh, to, to uh, products to do that, uh, I think that'll be uh, an amazing future. Sanjeev, great to have you on theCUBE, and great to have you as a collector, uh, can, uh, a CUBE collective member. Um, Thank you so much. And I want to ask you one final question. We're here at IBM Think in Boston. If, you, if we had the executive team in front of us, Arvin and his staff, what would you ask them and what would you advise them? First of all, first of all we'll do things. Give them a direct order, yep. mandate. Yep. No, and then what question would you ask? So the mandate would be make things as simple as possible and not any simpler for the consumers. Consumers do not have the time of the day to be researching like we do as analysts. You know, they have a day job. So my question to him would be, how can you have a cohesive strategy that solves the business problems, not technology problems? Sajid Mohan here on theCUBE with me, John Furrier, your host. We are in the pop-up cube, small little one camera shot. We'll do whatever it takes to get the content, get the best analysis we can, share that with you. That's our mission on theCUBE. And behind me, tomorrow we will be in that convention center in Boston, getting here in Arvind Krishna to talk about the vision for IBM and this next year. As they go to the next level, IBM well positioned to, to make it to the winner's circle in this next generation AI race. I'm John Furrier for theCUBE, thanks for watching.